And let's pray together. Lord, we come before your word this morning so needful of having our thoughts recalibrated to your truth, to think and see the way you think and see, to absorb what you have revealed about reality. We're so easily swayed and fooled by the things we can see, by the things our world portrays by the ever-present pressure of the world around us to squeeze us into its mold. We pray to be renewed even this morning, to think rightly, to think with an eternal perspective, to think soberly about ourselves and the world around us. God, would you help us to these ends, that you might be glorified in our thoughts, that you might be glorified in our lives and our response to your truth. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in power in our lives to conform us to the image of your Son, uh, to make us effective instruments in your hand in this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember, we're making our way through the book of Romans, and in Romans chapter 12, in the last several verses, we have these unnatural directives. Never pay back evil for evil. Be at peace with all men as far as it depends on you. Never take revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath. As we talked about last week, leaving room for the wrath is not like leaving room for cream in your cup of coffee, but leaving the cup totally empty. That God will make all things right. And last week we looked at that great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. That great day when all the wicked dead will appear before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an accounting for every single thing they've done and thought and said. And we talked about anyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This morning we're going to take up that theme again and talk about what happens right after that great white throne judgment for all who appear there. This morning we're going to look at a sort of a survey of the biblical doctrine of hell, the biblical doctrine of hell. Hell is a place of eternal punishment for those who don't believe the gospel, for the unrepentant, for those who don't know God personally through Jesus Christ. It is the eternal destiny of the religious and the atheist alike, everyone outside of Christ. I try to think about hell every day, It's emotionally difficult to think about hell for sustained periods of time. To think about unrepentant people spending eternity under the wrath of God, conscious, conscious, in pain, in darkness, alone, forever. We tend to want to avoid the idea of hell any way that we can. Our culture plays off the reality of hell with lighthearted casualness. They sing songs, hell's bells, a highway to hell. Maybe you grew up reading Gary Larson's Far Side comic strip, poking fun at hell. Maybe you've been exposed to or used casual use of the word hell. War is hell. Outside, it's as hot as hell. It's as cold as hell. I never understood that last one. Or we think if hell real, if hell is real, if there's such a thing as hell, it must be a party with my friends, a good time for everyone who doesn't want God to tell them what to do. Well, I'll just go down there together and we'll yuck it up. Or perhaps hell is a place reserved for only the worst of the worst. Pol Pot, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin. And the world has placed its hopes in any kind of alternative to hell. And oftentimes the Christian world does the same thing. And the post-mortem alternatives that are out there range from naturalism, that is, you're just made of dirt, and when you die, that's it. You go out of existence. Nature is all there is. Or annihilationism, that's the view that, okay, maybe you've done some things wrong, and if you don't make to heaven, uh, you, you go there before God, and you get zapped, and you cease to exist. That's annihilationism. 
universalism, the view that eventually everybody just ends up in heaven. Or purgatory, the Catholic doctrine that you go to meet God and you have to pay for your crimes after death. And once you're purged of all of those crimes, eventually you show up in heaven. Or reincarnation, the Eastern view that you go through various cycles of heavens and hells and various life forms and you come back better than you were last time if you did good or worse than you did last time if you did bad. And the ultimate goal in reincarnation is a blissful nothingness where you're not conscious of anything. Many, whether they would articulate it this way or not, believe in an afterlife of self-determination. That is, I'll make my eternity what I want it to be when I get there. Some have said, if hell is real, then I'll figure it out and I'll, I'll finagle a way out of it and I'll sort it out or I'll endure it as best as I can. And you can no more determine your own self-existence and eternity than you could here can't make reality something different than it is. And others have proposed a sort of second chance evangelism. It would only be fair for everybody to hear the gospel, and so you'll show up in front of Jesus Christ, and he'll present the gospel to you, and then the choice is made. But none of those alternatives are real. What the Bible portrays is it is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. No second chances. And if you're here this morning and you're thinking that talking about hell is perhaps in bad taste or lacking in love, I want to share an illustration from John Blanchard with you. He writes, on the 12th of December, 1984, dense fog shrouded M25. I guess that's a highway in England. A few miles south of London. The hazard warning lights were on, but were ignored by most drivers. At 6.15 a.m., a truck carrying huge rolls of paper was involved in an accident. And within minutes, the carriageway was engulfed in carnage. Dozens of cars were wrecked. Ten people were killed. A police patrol car was soon on the scene, and two policemen ran back up the motorway to stop oncoming traffic. They waved their arms and they shouted as loud as they could, but most drivers took no notice and raced on towards the disaster that awaited them. The policemen then picked up traffic cones and flung them at the car's windscreens in a desperate attempt to warn drivers of the danger. One told how tears streamed down his face as car after car went by and he waited for the sickening sound of impact as they hit the growing mass of wreckage farther down the road. The reality is, it's not loving to not talk of hell. It's not loving to not speak the truth about what happens after this life for any who don't know Christ. This morning in our biblical survey of hell, we're just going to try to see what the Bible itself has to say about this. And you need to know that most of what we'll look at this morning come from the lips of Jesus. And WGT Shedd said, there's no one better to speak of hell than Jesus the Christ. Why? Because he is the one who actually has endured the full wrath of God in the place of sinners who believe. He knows what's at stake. And as we looked last week, he is the one who sits on the throne and judges those who will be thrown into the lake of fire. To hear the warnings from Jesus will be a tremendous help for us this morning. And I know Jesus gets the reputation sometimes of being a sweet, gentle Jesus who would never condemn anybody. But if you've opened your Bible, you know that Jesus spoke of hell more often than he spoke of heaven. And it was appropriate for him to warn us of the wrath to come. The first thing we're going to look at this morning is that hell is real. Hell is real. And we begin just with this very real warning from Jesus in Matthew 23, 33. He says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? And in John 5, 29, he says that those who committed evil deeds will come forth to a resurrection of judgment. 
By the way, the scripture references we'll go through this morning are all typed out for you on the online web outline. So you can listen and you can go get all those references online if you'd like to. Jesus spoke often of hell and he spoke clearly about hell. He spoke more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. Jesus taught that hell is a real literal place where unrepentant sinners will endure the wrath of God without relief forever and ever. Jesus talked about hell as being characterized by fire, by fire. I counted 18 times that Jesus described hell with fire. Matthew 5, 22, he called it the fiery hell. In Matthew 18, he said, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. Matthew 25, 41 he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In Mark 9, 43, he called it an unquenchable fire. Think about fire for just a moment. Have you ever been burned and experienced the physical pain? Jonathan Edwards, in one of his uh, many sermons on hell, by the way, Jonathan Edwards wrote more about heaven than he did about hell, just in case you were wondering or about proportions. But he did preach a number of sermons on the doctrine of hell, and in one of those, he writes this. We can conceive but little of the matter, but to help your conception, imagine yourself to be cast into a fiery oven or of a great furnace where your pain would be much greater than that occasioned by accidentally touching a coal of fire, as the heat is greater. Imagine also that your body were to lie there for a quarter of an hour, all the while full of quick sense. That means you're aware of what's happening. What horror would you feel at the entrance of such a furnace? And how long would that quarter of an hour seem to you? And after you had endured it but for one minute, how overbearing would it be to you, think, to, you to think that you had 14 more to endure? But what would be the effect on your soul if you knew you must lie there enduring that torment to the full for 24 hours. And how much greater the effect still, if you knew you must endure it for a thousand years. Oh, then would your heart sink if you thought, if you knew that you must bear it forever and ever, that there would be no end. That after millions of millions of ages, your torment would be no nearer to an end than ever it was, and that you never, never should be delivered But your torment in hell, Edwards goes on, will be immensely greater than this illustration represents. How then will the heart of a poor creature sink under it? How utterly inexpressible and inconceivable must the sinking of the soul be in such a case? I don't know if you've thought about hell that long before. You might ask, how can something burn perpetually and never be consumed? Some have said, well, hell can't be real, fire can't be real, because when something burns, it, it disintegrates, it goes away. Uh, we've, this isn't the first time we've seen something burning by the power of God that isn't consumed. Do you remember the burning bush? Certainly the power of God is at work here, not merely some physical feature. Hell is not only characterized by fire, but also by pain, and a pain that is without relief. Jesus said in Luke 16, 24, a story of Abraham and um, Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man ends up in torment under God's judgment, and Lazarus is in heaven in Jesus' parable. And the rich man cries out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. And what's described there is real physical agony. Jesus said in Matthew 13, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks, those who commit lawlessness, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that refrain, weeping and gnashing of teeth, occurs again 
and again in Jesus' descriptions of hell. Hell is characterized also by wrath. By wrath, that just means God's anger. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Truth is, everybody outside of Christ is already in the condition of having God's wrath aimed at him. Hell is not the playground for the wicked. Hell is not the place where Satan gets to rule the way he wants. Hell is the place where God's wrath is poured out. Hell is also said to be characterized by destruction. Jesus said, Matthew 7, 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many enter it. Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able both to destroy body and soul in hell. And those who have argued for some sort of annihilation view has, have, have honed in on this word destruction and said, how could something be said to be destroyed and then still go on existing. Hell, therefore, must have a stop. <laughs> but that is not what the Bible means by destruction. The Bible means a destruction that keeps on destroying while never causing something to cease to exist. Utter, infinite, interminable ruin. Hell is also characterized by a knowledge of heaven. Knowledge of heaven. Jesus said in Luke 13, And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you're from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out. Jesus also indicated this in this story he told about Lazarus and the rich man. He said there's a great chasm between the two. And while the rich man was characterized as being able to see into the kingdom, there was no crossing back and forth. That knowledge of what is missed out, that knowledge of not being in heaven, is an additional emotional torment. Hell is also characterized by darkness, Matthew 25, 30. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave, deep in a cave where natural light doesn't enter and you turn out all the flashlights. That does something to the soul. It might be entertaining for a few minutes. Try counting to 60 with the lights out. It's hard to last that long. What will it be like to be cast into outer darkness? Some have said, well, you can't have darkness and fire together at the same time. Yes, you can. Actually, in the physical world, you can have fire that is invisible. If you've ever seen a top fuel dragster catch on fire and a driver rolling around and you don't see any smoke, you don't see any flames, things can burn without being seen, without emitting light. Aside from the physics of that observation, if God says there is a hell with fire and darkness, then there is. Hell is characterized also by sheer terror. Mark 9, 42, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. What is Jesus saying there? It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. Uh, one who has sinned against a holy God and specifically sinned against those whom God has set his affections on. It's better for him to die in the worst possible way imaginable than to go into the lake of fire. Sheer terror. Hell is characterized also by a separation from God. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. That is a Sobering reminder to all who profess Christianity who have not surrendered to Jesus Christ personally. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? 
And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins who are knocking on the door and ends with this statement, Lord, open up to us. And the master replies, truly, I do not know you. And the door remains shut. Matthew 25, 46, these will go away into eternal punishment. This whole idea of going away, what a, what a sickening thought this is. The moment after you die, to be on the very doorstep of never-ending and ever-increasing enjoyment in the presence of the beauty and goodness of God and all that he has made for those who love him, only to hear the words, go away. You can't come in here. You, you don't belong here. It's reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had wonderful, immediate fellowship with God in the garden. And after sin and the fall, God stationed a cherubim with a flaming sword at the entrance to the garden and said, you can't come in here anymore. The reality is sin separates us from God and all of his goodness and holiness. And what a tragedy to remain in your sins and then on that final day to be told, go away. Hell is characterized by removal from God's presence. But you must know that hell is also characterized by the very presence of God. <laughs> The rule of God. Matthew 10, 28, remember Jesus said, don't fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It is God's wrath that is being poured out in hell. It is God's very presence that makes hell so awful. Remember that the eternal fire, Matthew 25, 41, was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for them to rule the roost, but to be hell's first victims. God is the one pouring out wrath. What is it that makes hell, hell? Is it the complete and total absence of God? I think rather it is the presence of God that makes hell so awful. You might think that you can avoid God in this life, but you cannot. And you certainly cannot escape him in the next life. The writer to Hebrews says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The rule of God in hell will be one of righteousness, justice, and holiness. His beauty and his goodness must leave no sin unpunished. In fact, a really striking statement occurs in Revelation 14. Those who are to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels... Uh, Revelation 14, 10, are to suffer there in the presence of the Lamb. That is Jesus Christ himself. It is God's very presence that makes hell so awful for the unrepentant. Hell is real. Hell is not a myth. Hell is not a scare tactic designed by religious elite to try to keep the people in line. Religious fairy tale to make people behave. No, hell is very real. There is real physical suffering, real emotional torment. The, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth can be taken one of two ways. Either that is the, the weeping of lament and remorse and sorrow, not repentance, but I don't like what's happening right now. And the grinding of the molars is a, an expression of the agony, emotional and physical agony being experienced. Some have, have suggested, however, that this weeping and, and gnashing of teeth is an expression of the unrepentant heart in hell. Still gnashing and lashing out at the heart level against a holy and good God. Whatever that expression entails... It is real, conscious awareness, awareness of suffering, awareness of loss. Hell is real. Secondly, according to the Bible, hell is eternal. Hell is eternal. Jesus said in Matthew 18, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away from you. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands, two feet, and be cast into 
eternal fire. Matthew 25, 41, he said, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 46, these will go away into eternal punishment. Mark 9, 43, those will go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. In Mark 9, 48, Mark describes it, or Jesus describes it as a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, a quote from Isaiah. The worm is that which decomposes a corpse. And that decomposition, that ruining, destructive activity goes on forever. The worm doesn't die. And the fire is not quenched. The fire never goes out. Its fuel is never consumed. Daniel 12, 2 describes it as everlasting contempt. Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, who receive the mark of the beast. Revelation 20, 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You might wonder, how does an infinite sentence comport with a finite crime? We need to understand, first of all, that our crimes are not finite. They are in keeping with the nature of the person we have offended. God himself is infinite in his nature. A crime against God is an infinite crime. Secondly, you have to understand that there is no repentance from those crimes. The guilt still stands. As long as the guilt remains, the punishment is fitting. Now, there is no sorrow over the sin. There is no genuine repentance. We understand from uh, the New Testament that repentance is a gift produced by the Holy Spirit in the heart of man. There is no such repentance in hell. And so those who are there are still autonomous, rebellious, unrelenting in their sin. The sorrow that is there is only an agonized remorse. Peter sorrowed over his sin in disowning Christ. It's a biblical sorrow. Judas sorrowed over his profiteering by turning Jesus into the authorities, but not with godly sorrow. He took his own life. That's the kind of sorrow that will populate hell forever. And eternity brings every torment of hell to infinite proportions. Eternity magnifies despair. Eternity shuts the door on the faintest glimmers of hope. Thomas Watson in his book, Body of Divinity, writes this. Eternity is a sea without bottom and without banks. After millions of years, there is not one minute in eternity wasted. And the damned must ever be burning, but never consuming, always dying, but never dead. The fire of hell is such as multitudes of tears will not quench it. Length of time will not finish it. The vial of God's wrath will always be dropping upon a sinner. As long as God is eternal, he lives to be avenged upon the wicked. Oh, eternity, eternity, who can fathom it? Mariners have their plummets to measure the depths of the sea, but what line or plummet shall we use to fathom the depth of eternity? The breath of the Lord kindles the infernal lake, and where shall we have engines or buckets to quench that fire? O oh, eternity, if all the body of the earth and sea were turned to sand, and all the air up to the starry heaven were nothing but sand, and a little bird should come every thousand years and Fetch away in her bill but the tenth part of a grain of all that heap of sand. What numberless years would be spent before that vast heap of sand would be fetched away? Yet, if at the end of all that time the sinner might come out of hell, there would be some hope. But the word forever breaks the heart. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. What a terror is this to the wicked. Enough to put them into a cold sweat to think as long as God is eternal, he lives forever to be avenged upon them. Hell is real and hell is eternal. Thirdly, hell is irreversible. 
Hebrews 9.27 makes it very clear. It is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. I've eaten a lot of fortune cookies in my life. I'm waiting to crack one open and read Hebrews 9.27 on a piece of paper. It hasn't happened yet. I don't know if I can infiltrate the factory. There's no more needed message for man but to recognize there is one life, one opportunity while you have breath to be right with your maker. There are only two paths. Jesus said, how will you escape the sentence of hell? <laughs> There's only one way. Everyone who does not belong to Jesus Christ in this life there awaits for him an irreversible judgment that takes place after you die. You will be alone before God. There will be no plea bargaining, no defense, no jury, no chance for pardon, no parole, no stay of execution, no getting out early for good behavior. There will be a guilty verdict and the commencement of a sentence which will never end. And this causes the soul to be crushed to despair with no relief and no compassion. They say that misery loves company. There will be no company for misery in hell, no comfort gained from sympathizers. God will not have sympathy on you. Satan nor the demons will have not have sympathy on you. No angel will have sympathy on you. Those who are believers in this life will not have sympathy on you then. You will have no sympathy from other humans who are likewise in torment. There will be no compassion from your mother or your father. You cannot get an encouraging pick-me-up from your pastor or your friends. You will not be able to comfort yourself. Your conscience will forever rage that your guilt remains and there is no hope. There will only be anger and hatred and unrepentant sin. And in this life, sin wears a costume. Do you know that, right? Do you know the tricks? In this life, sin tastes sweet. And sometimes we experience the bitter aftertaste of sin, guilt, remorse, temporal consequences. But we're still tricked and played by the costume. In hell, all enticement will be stripped away. All the sweetness will be gone. The mask will be removed. And all that will exist is the bitter taste. Sin has always been out to deceive and to destroy, and only when it is too late will sin's full intention be realized. Sin is real and eternal and irreversible. I'm sorry, hell is real, eternal, irreversible. Fourthly, hell is also imminent. Hell is imminent. That just means it's close. It's nearby. Hell is knock, knock, knocking on a human's door. Jesus said, be on the alert. You don't know the day or the hour, Matthew 25, 13. Luke 3, 9 records, indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees so that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Luke 12, 20, God said to the man, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? Luke 12, 46, the master of the slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour when he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. John 3.18 says, He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.36 again, He who does not believe has the wrath of God abiding on him already. And Romans 2.5 says, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when the revelation of his righteous judgment of God is on display. In describing that verse, Jonathan Edwards said, human sin is like a, a putting water behind a great big dam. And that dam is holding back all of that weight of water. That dam is God's mercy. And someday 
that dam will let go and all of the sin we've been putting behind it in that great body of water will be unleashed. We are storing up wrath. This idea of hell's Imminency is the thought behind Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And if you've read it, you remember the scene, that portion where he describes the person who has not yet repented like a spider hanging by a thread over the fire. And that thread will inevitably break, and it could break at any moment, and the spider would plunge irretrievably into the fire. Every human being walking the earth right now is like that spider. You don't know when your days are done. You don't know when you will walk out of time and step into eternity and meet your maker and give account. Imminence means that you could die at any moment. And whenever you die, it will come sooner than you are ready. And the very next thing that happens to you will be to appear in the presence of the one whom you have offended. The one that you have provoked to anger. The one whose truth you knew but suppressed. The one whose patience you took for granted. The one whose love you rejected. The one whose warnings you ignored. The one whose gospel you refused. Hell is real, eternal, irreversible, imminent, and final. Hell is final. We looked at this last week in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. How do you get to hell? The broad path, the easy path, the path you were born on, Our world around us is like the boaters in the 1950s that I watched a documentary about as a kid and have never forgotten. They were on the Niagara River, upstream of that great big water feature, Niagara Falls. And they were having engine problems. And the dad is trying to pull the cord on that little outboard motor casually. And they're floating downstream slowly, imperceptibly. And they're having a picnic. And they had plenty of time to row to one shore or the other, even if the motor didn't work. But they thought, oh, no, we'll, we'll get this going. And they delayed and delayed and delayed to the point that they, when they finally got the motor running, it was too late. The river had picked up speed and took the family of four over the edge, and they all died. And our world is in that river. They were born there. They live there. They work and play there. They marry there. They do all the things of life there. And while there, they enjoy God's kindness and benefits and patience and his common love to all of humanity. And they sing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Who are these people? 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, these are the ones who do not obey the gospel. Jesus calls them in Luke 12, 46, unbelievers. According to 1 Corinthians 6, they are the unrighteous, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, and swindlers. Revelation 21, 8 calls them the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Who in this room is not on that list? We're all there. God's word allows no relief, no comfort, no hope that you can maintain a godless life here and yet escape the sentence of hell. The finality of the sentence is so striking. There is no turning back, no redo, no respawn, replay, reset. This is forever. And eternity means this is a wrath that you cannot resolve yourself to endure. A loneliness you cannot cope with, a blackness you cannot get used to, a suffering that you cannot take a break from, cannot be distracted from, cannot daydream during, cannot tune out. You cannot medicate, inebriate, or ameliorate this suffering. This is a discomfort you cannot ignore as you go about your business. Enduring God's wrath will be your business. 
There will be no person, no thing, no thought to console you. Your sentence will be to endure the unendurable, to bear the unbearable, to tolerate the intolerable, to be perpetually destroyed but never annihilated under the infinite weight of the glory and justice and holiness of Almighty God. This is an unspeakable hopelessness and the darkest despair. This is why Dante, in his medieval depiction of it, in his inferno, placed the sign over the top, Abandon hope, all you who enter here. Jonathan Edwards writes, Consider how great and awful a thing eternity is. Although, for, although you cannot comprehend it, the more by considering it. Yet you may be made more sensible that it's not a thing to be disregarded. Do consider what it is to suffer extreme torment forever and ever. To suffer it day and night from one year to another, from one age to another, from a thousand ages to another. And so adding age to age and thousands to thousands in pain, in wailing, in lamenting, groaning and shrieking and gnashing your teeth with your souls full of dreadful grief and amazement with your bodies and every member full of racking torture, without any possibility of getting ease, without any possibility of moving God to pity your cries, without any possibility of hiding yourselves from him, without any possibility of diverting your thoughts from your pain, without any possibility of obtaining any manner of mitigation or help or change for the better. Do consider how dreadful despair will be in such torment. How dismal will it be when you are under these racking torments to know assuredly that you never, never shall be delivered from them, to have no hope. When you would rejoice if you might have any relief after you shall have endured these torments millions of ages, but shall have no hope of it. After you shall have worn out the age of the sun, the moon, and the stars in your dolorous groans and lamentations without rest day and night or one minute's ease, yet you shall have no hope of ever being delivered. After you shall have worn out a thousand more such ages, you shall have no hope. But you shall know that you are not one whit nearer to the end of your torments, but that there are the same groans, the same shrieks, the same doleful cries incessantly to be made by you, and that the smoke of your torment shall still ascend up forever and ever. Your souls, which shall have been agitated with the wrath of God all this while, will still exist to bear more wrath. Your bodies, which shall have been burning all this while in these glowing flames, shall not have been consumed, but will remain to roast through eternity, which will not have been at all shortened by what shall have been past. It may be tempting to you right now to think, maybe it won't really be like that. Maybe I'm not really bad enough to deserve that. Maybe there will be a second chance. Listen, if that is your hope this morning, your hope is ill-founded. You are hoping against everything God has said. You are hoping everything that God has declared in his word. And you are being tempted to disagree with God himself. A groundless hope like that should be no comfort for you in the face of what God has already said it will be like. If you're hoping that hell is not real or that you will not deserve it, your hope is unfounded and your soul is in grave danger. The one who tells you what lies ahead, the one who rightly assesses your condition, is the same one this morning through his word that offers you eternal life. And not just escape from hell, but entrance into heaven, into his glorious presence. And he offers you this at the cost of his only son, whom he crushed by this same infinite punishment. Consider this, Jesus, the son, the one who will judge the living and the dead, is the same one who took on flesh, the same one who warned us about judgment to come. He is the same one who bore infinite judgment at the cross. Listen, a knowledge of hell is not enough to get you into heaven. Fear of hell is not the same thing as delighting in God. Fear of hell does not produce delight in God. You can't get to heaven simply by fleeing from hell. You get to heaven by fleeing to Jesus Christ. And there's no other way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one comes to the Father except by him. 
And what you think about hell exposes what you actually believe about God. It exposes what you actually believe about Jesus, and it exposes what you actually believe about yourself. There's a relationship between hell and the rest of what you believe. The suffering in hell is not designed to correct or educate or reform or purge. Hell is the necessary reaction of God's glory in the presence of sin. God's infinite holiness, his goodness, and his rightness, the outshining radiance of his attributes will react in proportion to their greatness in the presence of sin. And so you and I have a problem of infinite proportions. An inadequate perspective of hell reveals in us an inadequate view of our sin. It reveals an inadequate perspective on the cross. If I say my sin doesn't deserve hell, then I do not know the glory of God. I don't know the terror of God. I don't know the depth of my own sin. And I also must say I don't need a substitutionary atonement. To say that hell is not real or to say that I don't deserve it is to say that Jesus died for no reason. Jesus himself said, I came to lay down my life for my sheep. I have come to seek and to save the lost, to save them from himself, to save them from wrath. Jesus knew about hell and he laid down his own life as a substitute at the cross to pay in his person the infinite penalty due our sin. Jesus endured an infinite divine retribution for the sins of others so that they would undoubtedly go free. John 3, 16. God so loved people like us. As bad as we are, that he gave his only son, that all the believing ones in him, whoever would believe in him, certainly will not perish, but will absolutely possess eternal life. Consider what Jesus took upon himself, what he bore at the cross. Isaiah 53, from us, what did he get? Our griefs, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, our straying, our rebellion, our sin. And what did Jesus receive from his father? Smiting and affliction and crushing, oppression, slaughter, judgment, anguish of soul and death. Mark 15, 34 adds this thought that even as Jesus is being crushed by the Father, he is also being abandoned by the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a remarkable picture of hell, the simultaneous visiting of a holy God and abandonment by a holy God. Before we can see the cross as our remedy, we must actually reckon with the reality that hell is our appropriate destiny. Hell is deserved by me. Hell has been earned by me. Hell is inescapable for me unless, unless God in his great love. Have you turned to Jesus Christ? Have you found a savior from sin? Martin Luther said, look, if a doctor had the cure to some fatal disease, and did not run around the city streets offering it freely, what kind of a doctor would he be? Friends, what, what are we doing with what we know? Let me give us this morning a simple to-do list. There's three things. There are many more things that ought to flow out of a right view of a biblical doctrine of hell. But to-do number one, believe the gospel. Today, if, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ, cast your life on him and be forgiven. Have a guarantee of eternal life, escape from hell, entrance into heaven, and be a new creature before him. God loves to save sinners. If you don't know what it's like to be saved, lots of people in this room do. Turn to somebody near you and ask, how can I be saved? Number two, proclaim the gospel. Believer, proclaim the gospel. Remember those policemen picking up traffic cones and throwing them at windshields? Look, kids in the backseat of cars in junior high fashion 
could make fun of those policemen. Oh, what are those guys doing? What a bunch of nimrods. Ha, ha, ha. The policemen don't care. They didn't care what people thought about them. They didn't care about the opinions of people they were trying to warn against going to certain death. Friends, we are too consumed with what people think about us when we should be warning people about eternal destruction. To do number three, and this takes us back to Romans 12, leave room for the wrath. Leave all of it. Don't take revenge. God will have his day. Leave room for that wrath. Let's pray. God, you're so kind. While we were breathing on this earth to give us words from heaven, words of life, an invitation to repentance, to faith, an invitation to you. We beg this morning, O oh God, that no one would leave this room unsaved, unrescued, content to walk down a broad path and float down the river to destruction merrily, merrily. Would you be pleased, O oh God, this morning to bring real conviction of sin and a heart cry of help. God, would you be pleased to rescue and to save. You said that you would grant eternal life, that you indeed would save all who call on the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We beg for that this morning in Jesus' name.